Today we have Elaine O'Brien. She's a professor of modern and contemporary art history at California State University, Sacramento, where she offers a sequence of undergraduate and graduate courses in theory and criticism and the art of the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. O'Brien has lectured locally, nationally, and internationally on global feminisms, global modernisms, and the work of underrepresented artists. She is the lead and uh, editor of the 2012 anthology, Modern Art in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, an introduction to global modernisms, published by Wiley and Blackwell and internationally distributed. O'Brien's current research project situates art produced and taught in California's new public university art departments in 1960s and 70s within the global and local context of the era's so sociopolitical uh, revolutions, a theme explored uh, in February in New York and at the California Art Association session she chaired titled, Patron of Diversity, the Golden State, the People's University and the Rise of the Rest. In May, she will present a keynote lecture titled, Towards a Global Regionalism, Art History at the Crossroads at the Nordic 2015 Art History Conference in Iceland. Ooh, and with that, let's give a round of applause for Elaine. Thank you, um, Sarah, everybody. This is lovely to be here um, at the Crocker. Um, I am a, a feminist um, and, of course, as you just heard, an art history professor at the local university. So I'm really glad to have this opportunity to speak with you, Crocker docents, about women artists in the museum collection. You and I serve the same public. Um, and for the same purpose of art education, we are co-teachers. What I tell my students about art um, and what you tell your students, Crocker visitors, is meant to increase their understanding and appreciation of the art we show them. We try to help them to see better and engage more meaningfully with the art that they see. As important, however, and this is going to be the focus of my talk today, is that we help our students ask questions of art that are important to their lives and to their possibilities. Questions about why this and not another artwork is important enough to be in this beautiful museum. What are the criteria for getting in? And why are there so many more works of art by male artists uh, than by women artists? How did this woman artist achieve historical significance? Meaning, how did this work get into the collection? What is historically significant about it? And how did this artist make it, so to speak? Not loud enough? It was a little far away. Oh. I want them to be able to hear you. OK. Well, I can speak up. Is it hard for you to hear me in the back? Can you? Now, now it's better. All right. OK, my lecture today, I'm going to make it um, an hour. Um, so I hope we can have a little discussion afterwards. Uh, I do tend to go on. I don't know if any of you have had me as a teacher, but I forget time when I'm talking about art. Um, so I've only selected a handful of women artists uh, to talk about works by uh, Rosa Bonheur, tried to span time, uh, George O'Keefe, uh, Hung Lu, and Judith Lowry. So we'll see if I get to Judith Lowry. I hope so, because she's a, she's a fantastic artist. OK, um, so I can only show you these, talk about these few uh, artists. Um, so what I'm going to do, what I want to do is, is propose an approach for you to talk about all works by women artists in the museum. 
So it's um, an approach that might entail, depending upon you know you, your background or what how you how you work, um, that might entail an additional focus to what you're already doing, um, and perhaps another question or two uh, for you to discuss with your um, guests as you talk, say in front of a work of art in the museum. So I ask you, or I ask Jill Peace, I don't know if it worked or not, uh, to send you Linda Nochlin's 1971 uh, essay. You're all nodding your head. Good, you've read it. Yeah, excellent. That's, that's great. Not all my students always read everything I've asked them to prepare for, for lecture. So you read that, and then um, the 2003 update um, by Ann Landy. So we have then um, a sense of how, how we've done over those decades since the beginning of the feminist uh, movement in art, which is about when Nochlin wrote that piece in 1971. The feminist art movement had only been underway really a few years at that point. So she's really uh, friends with those women in New York and she's, um, she's writing it into history. I should tell you she was my professor in my PhD program. <laughs> so I'm immersed in, in, in that. Um, so women artists have made enormous progress um, since, the, um, since that article was written, since the feminist movement in art began in the late 60s. Um, this year, the Museum of Modern Art in New York is featuring five shows um, by women, and four out of seven shows at the Tate are solo exhibitions by women this year. That's, that's more than half, right? <laughs> Tate, um, you know, so, uh, and also this uh, George O'Keefe's um, Jimson Weed White Flower, number one, sold for $44 million last November, 2014. Um, breaking the record for a work by a woman. But um, that said, O'Keeffe's um, 2014 auction record for female artists um, doesn't come close to the record held by a male artist. This work was sold in a year, a year before, in 2013. Um, this work by Francis Bacon, Three Studies of Lucian Freud, sold for 142 Point four million, uh, which was a record for male artists. So, a hundred million more, <laughs> not not quite, but there's a big difference there. Um, so this is uh, the uh, Pussy Galore's 2015 report card um, on the right for how the galleries are doing. Um, this is uh, Pussy Galore is an anonymous feminist collective. Um, and then it is next to uh, the same, you know, its model, the um, Gorilla Girls 1986 report card on those galleries in New York. So this is how are the galleries doing, how are the New York galleries doing, these big major galleries, uh, and showing women. So we, you could see we still have a long way to go. Um, some are doing very well, Zach Foyer, Gallery Le Long, but then others, um, where is this, this is 25%, so Marlboro, that's a major gallery. Leo Castelli, of course, very famous major gallery, 14%. Mary Boone, only 17% women. So there's still, you know, some are just, you know, over half. But the major, see Gagosian. Gagosian's 21. So I put a few uh, statistics up here um, just to sort of place us where we are, what we have to do, the work we have to do, um, why it's important to, to keep you know, working at this equity. 
Um, so we've come a long way since uh, 1971, this issue of why there have been no great women artists. Perhaps, you know, we could say it ended there in 71, hopefully. Um, uh, and today, 51% of visual artists are in the U.S. are women. However, only one-third of gallery represented representation is of women artists, uh, and that's um, about what we saw on P Pussy Galore's um, report card. And then women hold 24% of women of art museum director positions and earn 71 cents for every dollar earned by a male director. Um, only 5% of the art on display in U.S. museums is made by women in, um, that's about one in 20 in the museums. Uh, the Crocker does a lot better than that, um, but so just estimating um, a, a rough count, uh, 370 works of art on view at the Crocker, only 66 are by women, uh, which is one in 5.6, a lot better than uh, one in 20. Uh, of those 66, few have evident feminist uh, content or represent the experience of living as a woman physically or societally. So those are things to keep in mind as you do your, your work for the museum and for the people who come here um, to, you know, kind of motivate us a little bit um, to continue. We do, you know, the Crocker really does very well when it comes to its leadership, um, both the um, support, people like Marcy Friedman, a major supporter, um, and then, of course, the director, Lyle Jones, uh, and the founder, uh, Margaret Crocker. So, you know, we have a great um, base, administrative base, and um, funding base, too, uh, for this project of equity. And the uh, museum has been really um, terrific at bringing like um, Judy Chicago here. This was exciting. That was in May 2012. How many of you uh, heard her talk? And yes, oh good. So that was, you know, she's a very important historical figure in feminist movement. Her uh, program, her first feminist art program was at Fresno State. So it's very regional, uh, you know, something to be proud of here. Uh, she's one of ours in a sense, California certainly. Uh, there she is at the Brooklyn Museum where the, uh, her sort of master work, a collaborative work she did with many other women, um, but led, she, was the, she, she made it happen uh, at the uh, Brooklyn Museum. It's on permanent exhibition there. How many of you have seen that work? It's very impressively displayed, isn't it? Just beautifully displayed with all the banners. And, you know, so it's found its home at last. Went for many, many years with no, no place to see it. Um, and then uh, last year, the Kara Walker, a very, um, you know, very radical and, and you know, intense, um, provocation for us, uh, her show, to not only think again about race in America, but also sexual equity, sexual equality, because her work is very much informed by her, um, her, her position as a woman, a black woman, uh, like these two selections. These were um, on part of the show here, um, emancipating the, um, what's that say? Past. Emancipating the past, uh, Kara Walker's Tales of Slavery and Power. So they're very upsetting. Uh, you know, they're her beautiful, um, you know, the, the strategy of these silhouettes which she gets from late 19th century American um, culture, visual culture, uh, looks so uh, innocent, but she considers it very violent, a very violent cut. And here's an update of Lita and the Swan. It's very disturbing um, work, very provocative. So it's much to the museum's credit that they've invited these, um, these radical feminists really here. But we have in the collection, this is the first of the works I want to talk to you about. 
um, with this idea of what approach can you take when you are talking about this painting, for example, by Rosa Luxemburg. I'd like you to be able to kind of uh, apply uh, the uh, ideas maybe that, that I'm trying to convey today to other works of art, because there are a number of other works of art, all of them actually, uh, you could you could do this. So with her, you know, the thing to ask, you know, I have it kind of written on along the bottom there. Um, why is this painting by a woman uh, significant enough to be on view in the museum? It's a small painting. It's only ten and three eighths inches by thirteen and a half inches. So it's just a little painting, little landscape. Uh, it's not very imposing. It's not particularly, um, you know, striking, unusual in style. Um, it is a landscape that's probably a study for other paintings that she did. So why is it important that we have this work on view in the museum? Well, I'm just guessing that maybe it was a transitional painting. I don't know. I don't know her work at all. But it looks transitional between maybe realism and the academies and uh, impressionism. I have no idea. Okay, well that's a good, you know, that's a good offering. Um, I'm going to propose something else about historical significance. Um, has to do with actually her whole body of work and her um, remarkable contribution to the, the history of art. This is um, a case of a woman who made it she was probably the most, in her time, the most famous uh, woman artist in the 19th century. She was extremely successful. So how did she make it? You know, she, she became rich, she became famous. Uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth and uh, the Empress Eugenie uh, were her fans. She won prizes. Let me show you, okay? And then we can... Um, so this little, this is in the Crocker. This was a gifted work. Um, so Rosa Bonheur, this is a portrait of her on the left by Edouard Louis Dubouf. Um, and he's given her her attributes, her sketchbook and, and paintbrush, and her, um, her signature subject. Her signature subject is animals and they were rural farm animals in particular. She loved all animals though. She was said to have kept like a lion in her home and stuff like, you know, she was a big animal um, lover. Uh, and that's a photograph of her on the right a little later in life, 1880s. Um, so at that time in France, she would not have been allowed to go to the Academy of Fine Arts to study. Uh, so she uh, was, let me get back to, to that, her good fortune, and the thing to ask, you know, how these women made it, it is, um, well, as you read in Linda Nochlin, it has to do with having um, a liberated consciousness, not being um, so much conforming to the norms of their time, especially the domestic norms for women. This, these women, all the women I'm going to show you, did not put their domestic lives first. Uh, they were more like the great men artists in history, where the domestic life, the children, the partners, and so on, were not first. The art was first. It was the art that mattered. It was uh, their whole thing. And it was this Rosa Bunner's whole thing. Well, how'd she come to that? Where'd she get this liberated idea? It was from her father. Her father was a painter. You'll find this as a pattern quite consistent in the history of art, um, where there's, um, especially before, well, before the 1970s, let's say, um, where they had to get their education. If they couldn't get into the academy, 
there it was the father, or on occasion it was the uh, lover, or the partner, husband. Um, but mostly it's the father. Her father was a Saint-Simonian. He was a follower of Henri de Saint-Simon, the man who coined the term avant-garde uh, in uh, France in the 1830s. And he had many, many followers too for his theory. And his theories were uh, kind of socialism, utopian socialism. And one of the main features of that belief system is the equality of women. That women should not necessarily have to be um, playing a certain role. They should be able to choose their role. They should be able to do the work they're talented, where their talents um, lead them. They should have the full um, uh, privileges of men. And so she was reared by this father who was not only a painter and teaching her uh, how to paint, not just teaching her, but had brought her and her siblings into his studio to help them help them help him make his paintings. So they were his team of painters. They were his, um, you know, his fellow artists, and they were all equal to him. And he was encouraging to her. He encouraged her very much in her interest in animals. Uh, her mother uh, died when she was young. Uh, and so, you know, she really was reared by this very liberated father, a feminist father, avant la lettre, you know. So that was, you know, then her head was shaped by that, her mind, you know, her attitude towards her possibilities, what she could do. So um, this is why I have the quote down there. Um, I can't quite read. Could you pull that screen back a little bit if you're up there for me? Um, where, yeah, <laughs> sorry, to my father's uh, doctrines, I owe my great and glorious ambition for the sex to which, you know, the feminine sex to which I proudly belong and whose independence I shall defend to my dying day. So she was, you know, uh, a feminist. And, you know, she didn't marry, she was, um, in fact, um, her partner, she had two lifelong, two very long time partners, both of whom were women. She dressed in uh, male clothing whenever she wanted to, which was most of the time, uh, in order to make her art. This was, in, this is interesting, this is a permission de travestissement. Permission to cross-dress. <laughs> Had to get a legal permission. And so uh, she got legal permission. Uh, and she needed it. She needed to dress like a man when she went into slaughterhouses and to get, you know, go into slaughterhouse so you could get mo the muscle, the animals, you know, dead animals, to, to, to learn how to draw them properly. Was that the basis for granting her permission that she needed to go into slaughterhouse? Yes, yes. Uh, and she... Um, that is a good question, you know, so that she, she could argue that. I need this for, for what I'm doing, you know. <laughs> so there you are in your pants, and I'm wearing my pants too, right? So <laughs> sort of fun, and my kind of masculine-looking jacket. Um, so it's certainly funny to us today, but um, it's her whole lifestyle, you know, and it was important. And let me show you um, just a couple of her major works. Now... Uh, when, if you haven't seen these already, there are um, they're in you know major major uh, collections. Uh, this is at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, um, and it's very large. Look at the size of that. Her normal size, what she's famous for, are these huge paintings, 102 inches across. So you know that alone for a woman uh, to paint. Uh, at that scale, and that scale at the time meant important. That was the way it signified in the salons. It was, um, you know, she was very much accepted by the uh, powers that be. She was not avant-garde. She was only avant-garde in her personal attitudes towards her life's work, but her work itself was academic. And not only that, 
It was um, very safe. It wasn't political. Animals, it was, you know, in, 19, in 1849, I've got that underline there. Um, and does anybody know or remember what was happening in Europe in 1849? 1848, 1848. The revolution, very, um, this was when um, Karl Marx wrote his, you know, manifesto. I mean, it was, it was a major social revolution in uh, France, but also throughout Europe. Uh, thousands of people died. It was really um, uh, intense and troubling, and the monarchy, you know, the um, French monarchy kept coming back into power uh, over the 19th century, and it was in power at this time, uh, was very troubled by that. They didn't want their artists to be, you know, encouraging the people to revolt, like people like Courbet and Manet and people as radicals did. Um, it was, this was something that was comforting and soothing. This wasn't urban. This was um, stable. This was a life you could count on from the past, you know, and from the rural countryside. So she won awards. This was commissioned. Um, so, right, you know, that's uh, quite an achievement commissioned by the monarchy um, for the Salon of 1849. So it's quite a... Um, you know, she's a major figure, in other words, uh, uh, among the establishment at the time. This one, I'm only going to show you one more of hers, uh, but it's a major work. Uh, this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I'm sure some of you have seen this painting, right, at the, at the Met. Um, it's always on view. It's a major, major work. Um, so the horse fair, and very interestingly, her dressing uh, as a man uh, is exemplified. You could see her here. She's put herself in this painting among all these powerful horses and powerful men <laughs> in this gigantic painting, 16 and a half feet. Whoops. 16 and a half feet. So she was conventional, as I have done here, in her academic style, her subject matter, working methods. Um, so you would never put her with like impressionists or anything. She's a kind of realist academic. I just had a quick question. Is she was kind of unconventional at the time for her personal life? Why was she so conventional in her art? Well, she wanted, this is what she wanted to do. This is how she was trained. She didn't, her, she wanted to make this kind of art. And actually for a woman, it was, she was unique. This, that's how she's radical. That's why she's, you know, that's the, that's the achievement. She was successful in Salon. Very, and very, she got very rich. You know, it's like, I mean, how many... Women artists got rich and famous at this time. Uh, Empress Eugenie um, uh, visited her studio in Fontainebleau, awarded her the Cross of the Legion of Honor. Um, so, you know, and then when she had, when the horse fair, at this time paintings were like, you know, they'd got, they'd get famous and they'd be traveled around. And so the horse fair went to England to be exhibited probably people had to pay even to see it. Uh, and Queen Victoria ordered a private viewing at Windsor Castle. You know, so that's, um, that, so when you approach that little painting in the gallery uh, in the Crocker, you know, the, the thing you can ask, you know, how do you think this, why do you think this painting's in this museum? You know, because then it's not about formal analysis. You're not gonna see it in the way she applied her paint. This is a fallacy. What is of historical significance is not merely skill. We, as you well know, we have many, many highly skillful artists who never make it into art history. And never, if they don't make it into art history, they're not going to make it into the museum. Because museums are collections that, um, are about what matters to life and uh, 
what matters to life is what has historical significance because it is relevant to its time, relevant to life. There's no exceptions to that. We have so many beautiful, skillful works of art that are really fantastic decor, basically. Uh, and more than that, but they're not relevant to, they're not particularly relevant to life or to the time in which they were made. So when you are talking about art in the gallery, it, it's not enough if you're working on equity, if you're working on things, you know, like, what's it matter? This, what's it matter that this is here? Uh, it's important for you to know why that work of art is valuable uh, and why we need it in our collection. So, uh, otherwise, I mean, if you look at that painting, it won't hold on it. These, of course, these gigantic ones would, but this modest work wouldn't hold as far as just a formal analysis of value based on skill or subject or what. It's nothing that, that unique. Um, this is what, though, kind of is, right? <laughs> this is uh, Georgia Keefe. I know the colors are wrong, right? You could probably all tell me this is the one in the collection. Um, so now, you know, now that Georgia keeps, you know, her work is worth money, many millions of dollars, it's very easy to get digital um, slides online. You know, this is how we get our slides, right? We get our images off, off Google image search. <laughs> you just, you know, get the high resolutions and there's plenty of them. But there's still a problem with color, I think, definitely with this one. I fooled around with it in Photoshop, but I couldn't get it to look like the painting. Uh, but you know this painting, George O'Keefe, it was a man and a pot from 1942. Uh, she's born in 1887. So she'd been, you know, she's already an established artist by the time she made this painting. So this is from her uh, mature work. Um, she, uh, her, how'd she make it? You know, how did George O'Keefe make it? This is still, you know, this is uh, 18, born in 1887. This is not, you know, a period where, like after the 1970s where women, you know, there's plenty of opportunities. Um, but she did, uh, she was um, born in Wisconsin, uh, sun, near Sun Prairie, and uh, grew up in uh, Virginia. She did study art um, she st and was accepted into art school, so she got a regular art training. Um, she studied anatomical drawing with John Vanderpool at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, in, in 1905, two years later, she was in New York studying painting at the Art Students um, League uh, in New York. Uh, oh, this is what she did at the Art Students League in New York. Very, um, you might say, academic, realistic painting, uh, natural colors. You know, it's not, it's what we call... Um, a student study, but she won an award for that. Let me go back um, to her quotations um, to get some idea into uh, how she made it uh, when there were so few women making it at this level. Uh, one, of course, is character, you know, the attitude of the artist. Um, this one, the sort of strength of character, and then I'm going to talk about um, the opportunities she got um, uh, uh, actually through Alfred Stieglitz. Um, but the learning she got also gave her attitudes. I have to, I have had to go to men as sources in my painting. Um, because the past has left us so small an inheritance of women's painting that had a widened life. See, so her criteria here is painting that widened life. 
uh, that mattered, see. Um, and she could only get that. She said she couldn't find it, and uh, there weren't enough women artists. Um, before I put a brush to canvas, I question, is this mine? Is it all intrinsically of myself? Is it influenced by some idea or some photograph of an idea which I have acquired from some man? So she's, you know, really trying to think um, what is authentic to her. Um, and then this last one is interesting, uh, I think, for all of us, maybe. I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life, and I've never let it keep me from doing a single thing I wanted to do. So that, that's a really a lot of courage, isn't it, to, to be um, living with this terror, you know, being terrified all your life and yet going ahead and doing it. So that's kind of a quality of, of personality, of character, um, values, philosophical values. This one I just showed you, just to give you a sense of her early work. But um, actually, by 19, this is 1915, and it's an abstraction. Uh, it's an abstract drawing that she did uh, when she was teaching, she was teaching in uh, Virginia, South Carolina, and Texas. Uh, started doing these drawings uh, inspired by a class she'd taken from Arthur Wesley Dow on abstract design. Um, but abstract design, she takes it a step further, and she's making a drawing, this charcoal, of her um, feelings and sensations, you know, feeling in a double sense of, of emotional feelings, but also sensual uh, feelings, um, sensations. So these are, 1915 was very early for abstract art. Uh, the earliest abstract art we have uh, as art. Um, abstractions, of course, long precede that as design, but as art that has meaning, that's not until like 1911, 1912, and that would be artists like uh, Vasily Kandinsky, the great Russian abstract painter. Um, and they were all reading these things in New York. They were reading Kandinsky. They were aware of everything through magazine stuff, but she was not in New York. She was off on her own doing this. But she gets like this group of these drawings together and she sends them to her friend, uh, Anita Pulitzer, in New York. And Anita Pulitzer takes them to Alfred Stieglitz, who is probably the most uh, advanced modernist in the United States at that time. So he knew what he was looking at. You know, he was showing um, cubism. He was showing really the most radical European art. When, as it was being made uh, in New York. So he was very influential even prior to the very you know, important watershed exhibition, the Armory Show in 1913. So this is you know, the only place that people really would have known what, this, what, what they're looking at, that it's not just a design, it's actually got a lot of intentional meaning behind it. She's not just making something that looks pretty. She's trying to convey uh, feelings and sensations, her own. So through abstraction, and that's very advanced theory at that time. Uh, so she takes it to her friend, takes it to Alfred Stieglitz, and Alfred Stieglitz shows them in his gallery 291. So on the left is Stieglitz, about the time he met O'Keefe, uh, and then O'Keefe, about the time she met Stieglitz. Uh, the photograph of, of O'Keefe is by Stieglitz, uh, though you probably all know he did many photographs of her. Uh, he, she was a favorite subject of his. Uh, and he... Um, they fell in love. This is a great, um, one of the great, not only creative uh, friendships, but great love stories of the history of, of art. Uh, he, he was married at the time, at this time, uh, but they, um, 
they fell in love, and I think in 1924 they married and were married for a very long time until he died in what what is it 18 or 1948 or something like that. Um, so for the rest of his life, uh, but they you know it's a complicated story. I won't go into their their love story. But he was, you know, like I have on the slide, he was very well known. He was uh, an acclaimed photographer and a very important impresario of modern art, one of the only ones in this country at the time. Uh, like I said, until the uh, Armory Show 1913, um, he was really a major figure and he really, there was a school of Stieglitz, there was a group around him of important uh, artists uh, that have become historically uh, very significant. And I'll show you a little bit of that because that became her group. She became one of these, um, one of Stieglitz's circle. And these artists were very aware of cubism, of abstraction, of all the cutting edge art that was going on in Europe, and they were doing it um, at the same time. So it's not a matter of being late uh, in the avant-garde you know, value system. So this, kind of like Rosa Bonheur's father, you know, when you don't have a, a social system that is going to uh, give you equity, uh, you you can get equity at this point through this kind of man. You know, it's kind of like Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. You know, he's promoted her, supported her, believed in her, admired her. She moved into his circles. And this is how it was with uh, O'Keefe. So recognize her great talent, otherwise would have been lost. Like so many, we had countless talents lost to history because of inequity. Countless. And we can't retrieve them. So we just don't want any more to get lost. We don't want them to have to go find a strong man or have a strong father. Right? Well, so this is, um, this is important stuff for people, I think. He was a big promoter of her. He, you know, these photographs, he kind of uh, made this, uh, his myth of uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, you know, in, with her, you know, uh, engaged with it. As this uh, androgynous person, which she really, you know, really was, um, uh, and uh, yet feminine. And at the time, the reception of her emphasized her femaleness because that was exotic and different. You know, it's kind of like a primitivism, you know, where you have, oh, this woman, we have a new thing, you know, but they were smart enough to value that um, and not want things to be conventional in the same way they'd always been. Oh, let's look at this. But at the same time, they... Um, imposed upon her, which she uh, had to then deal with, this idea that her art is female uh, in style. You know, like, and you, you can think about that, you know, when you look at the painting, is there such a thing? Nochlin brings that up. She doesn't believe there is, right? You read that in her article. She didn't believe there is anything like a female style. Um, and, you know, I think she makes a strong case for that. Uh, but you still hear it today, and it is something we think about today. Is this particularly feminine um, material or style? Um, so, and these were the early reception. She got she got attention, you know, through him, press, um, and exhibition and stuff. So, her art. This is Paul Rosenfeld, the critic, um, New York critic. Her art is gloriously female. Following year asserted, there is no stroke by her brush, whatever it is she may paint, that is not curiously, arrestingly female in quality. Essence of very womanhood permeates her pictures. So it's a kind of, you know, I do see it as a kind of exoticism of the female, you know, rather than the sort of othering her as something new and interesting.